Hello and welcome back. This is Jonathan Gardner. We're covering section 1.7 of an introduction to thermal physics by Daniel V. Schroeder. And in this subsection of section 1.7, section 1.7 has all to do with calculating how quickly these processes that we've talked about in thermodynamics, how quickly they happen. And in the last previous subsection, we talked about heat conductivity. And now we're talking about the heat conductivity of an ideal gas. Recall from the last section that we had the Fourier heat conduction law, which is that the heat transferred per unit time is equal to minus kT, the area, and the temperature gradient. Okay, And this will give us the heat conduction flowing through like a pane of glass from one side to the other where there is a temperature gradient through the material in the x direction, but the y and z directions are all constant. The kT depends on the material that it's flowing through, and we've calculated, or rather we've talked about some of the values for some common substances you might run into. In this case, we're gonna calculate the kT for an ideal gas. We're gonna need some help. We're gonna have to use a little bit of kinetic theory, drawing on some of our experience from section 1.2. So in order to calculate KT, we need to think about how that energy is going to be transferred through the substance. So if we think about an ideal gas or really anything, like it could be a liquid, it could be a gas, there's a fluid and these particles are in some kind of motion. And so if we have some kind of energy entering from this side, the only way it can enter into the system is by actually hitting one of these particles, these molecules. And the way the energy is transferred through the substance is through the motion of these particles through the substance hitting other particles. And so if there's some temperature over here that's causing these particles to move faster than they otherwise would, it will take some time for these particles to transfer that momentum and energy to the other particles in the material. In order to calculate what the thermal conductivity of ideal gas should be, we're going to need a, a few values. One is this cursive L, which is going to be the mean free path. This tells us how far a particle can go before it hits another particle. We also need the average velocity, which we have inferred is very similar to the RMS velocity. Okay, And this tells us how fast the particles are traveling. We need to know about the average time between collisions for a particle, so how often a particle will hit another particle and transfer its energy. And the last little bit is we need to understand how that energy is going to flow. All right. In order to calculate the mean free path, we're going to make several assumptions. And these assumptions make the math possible, but they also are in some ways kind of ridiculous. So let's walk through the assumptions that we're going to make. Okay. We are going to say first that all particles, all molecules, all other molecules rather, are frozen in place. And the justification for this assumption is that the particles as they're moving are just as likely to move out of the way as they are to move in the way. And so we don't need to consider how fast they're moving or anything like that, right? So as this particle, as a single particle travels through the gas or the liquid or whatever, then we can just assume that the particles are either gonna move out of the way or move in the way. And so it wouldn't matter whether they're moving or not or how fast they're moving. So we just assume that their velocity is zero. The second thing is that we're going to consider that all other molecules have a radius of zero, um, but this one has a radius that's equal to two times the, the standard radius of a molecule, okay? And the reason why we're doing that is because we note that a collision occurs when the centers of the two particles get within two R of each other. So this happens if we consider that both particles have the same radius, so like this, it would also happen if we have one of the particles has no radius and the other particle has twice that radius, right? So in those two cases, either one, and so we'll just consider that it has twice the radius. So what we'll do now is we will draw a cylinder with a radius of two times the radius of a molecule, and the length of the cylinder will be the mean free path. And we're going to assume that this cylinder's volume is proportional or similar to the volume density of the particles in the 
gas or fluid, and the ideal gas, obviously, we're talking about. So we'll say L is proportional to the volume of the gas divided by the number of particles and divided by the volume of this cylinder, which is going to be 4 pi r squared times, I'm sorry, 4 pi r squared. Okay? So that gives us the mean free path. We could be more accurate in our observations here. We could consider the hemispheres at the end of the cylinder. We could talk about whether R is the right shape, whether these should be spheres or some other kind of shape. But the, the simple fact is that these assumptions and these uh, simplifications are grossly simplifications because the, the fact is the molecules will interact with each other at a range beyond their radius. We're using the radius just because that's kind of what, you know, that's just kind of how they work in practice. In order to calculate the delta t, this is just going to be the mean free path divided by the average velocity, which we'll assume is similar to the mean free path divided by the RMS velocity, the root mean squared of each particle, which for uh, atmospheric air, we've calculated the RMS v to be 500 meters per second, and the mean free path should be about 1.5 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. So we get that this uh, is about equal to 3 times 10 to the minus 10 seconds. Let's write out these numbers here. So this in, in normal air at standard atmosphere, standard pressure and temperature, the mean free path is uh, 1.5 times 10 to the minus 7. And the velocity is 500 meters per second. And so the delta T is that number there. At this point, we're going to try to calculate the KT for an ideal gas. And to do so, we're going to set up a gas, and it's going to have a temperature gradient in the x direction. And we're going to divide up this into regions that are L wide, the mean free path wide. And so we have temperature 1, temperature 2, uh, internal energy 1, and internal energy 2. And after delta T has passed, we expect that half the particles will flow to the right and half the particles will flow to the left. And so we can calculate the amount of energy that passes over this. And that's going to be the heat energy because no work is being done, no volumes are changing. So Q is going to be increasing with half of the internal energy of the left side and decreasing by half of the internal energy of the right side. So half of the energy crosses this way, half of the energy crosses this way, and the same for this one. So we're just considering the energy that crosses that barrier there. Okay. We can rewrite this as minus one-half U2 minus U1, which is just minus one-half the delta U, the change in the internal energy. Recall that the heat capacity with constant volume is just the change in internal energy over the change in temperature, keeping the volume constant. We can now rewrite this as minus one-half the heat capacity times delta t. And delta t is just the length between these two areas, that's the mean free path, times the temperature gradient. We want to solve for kt. kt is equal to minus it's q over delta t, the change in time, and that all is going to be also divided by the area and the temperature gradient. Okay, I'm using K, the Q over delta T is equal to minus KT times the area times the temperature gradient from our previous section's example. And so the Q is equal to minus one half, the minus signs cancel, so we get one half times CV delta T, I'm sorry, CV L DT by DX, all over the time change times the area times DT by DX. So we can cancel out the two DT by DXs. We can multiply the top and the bottom by L, and so we get one half CV over delta T, L squared at the top over AL. And AL is just the volume, so we get one-half CV over the volume 
times L over delta T. Well, that's the mean free path divided by the time, and that's just the velocity of the particles, the average velocity, that is, times the average velocity of the particles. Did I miss an L? I did. There's another L here. All right. So we've calculated that the KT for an ideal gas is equal to one half the um, heat capacity, keeping volume constant, divided by the volume times L times the average velocity. All right. CV, we call that we calculated for an ideal gas, is equal to F over two in the number of particles times the Boltzmann's constant K. And so we can substitute that in. So we get uh, F over four N K all over V L times the average velocity. But earlier we calculated the mean free path to be one over four pi R squared V over N. Okay. And so if we pl plug that in, we get uh, F over 16 pi R squared N and the V cancel from L, so we get K times the average velocity. So the heat conductivity of an ideal gas depends, it's proportional, I'm sorry, it's proportional to the KT. It's also proportional to the average velocity. And the average velocity, if you recall, is proportional to the square root of the temperature. This comes from the equipartition theorem. Using these numbers, we calculate that for air, we should get KT is about equal to 0 0.031 watts per meter Kelvin, which is very close to the actual value of 0 0.026 watts per meters Kelvin. This exercise shows how we can use kinetic theory to solve very difficult problems that thermodynamics itself can't solve, especially how things change over time. The homework problems are rather straightforward. Problem 163 is just to plug in some numbers to calculate a mean free path of 10 centimeters. 164 is to figure out what the heat conductivity or thermal conductivity of helium should be at room temperature. And 165 should be, is, 165 is a fairly challenging problem. It's one that I hope you approach and think about. So if you lived at a time in the 1800s when we didn't know what Avogadro's number was and we weren't even really sure that matter was made up of atoms, right, or particles, can you show using these numbers and the predictions that these theory makes, can you show basically a rough estimate of what Avogadro's constant should be? And remember, it wasn't until uh, the early 1900s that we were able to calculate Avogadro's constant. That happened after Robert Millikan was able to tell us what the charge to mass ratio for the electron was. And so after that, we were able to count the number of particles inside of a gas. Guys, I hope you found this interesting. I hope my reasoning wasn't too convoluted. Have a great day. Take care and bye-bye.